Today's video is brought to you by one of my favorite services, period, Audible. Audible is the home for audiobooks and spoken word entertainment. Here's how it works. You can visit the link in the description to get a free month of Audible. That free month gives you not only one title from their entire catalog, which you get to keep regardless of your membership status, but also a growing selection of included audiobooks, Audible originals, and more. I've got several months of listening time on Audible. I love the service. I use it sometimes while driving, sometimes while working. If you're a Star Wars fan and if you're watching my channel, you probably are. Pretty much every book is on there. Just a hint though, go for the unabridged, i.e. the full-length versions, and if you're looking for a recommendation, I would suggest Star Wars Brotherhood, which recently released, or if you want Legends, one of the original Thrawn trilogy books. If you want something that's not Star Wars, consider the Area X trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer, some of my favorite sci-fi. You can claim your free month of Audible by going to audible.com slash Eckhart's Letter, or by texting Eckhart's Letter to 500-500. That's audible.com slash Eckhart's Letter, or Eckhart's Letter to 500-500. On with the video. The flicking of the master droid control signal, the formation of the Empire in Order 66, did not simply end fighting throughout the Star Wars galaxy. Rather, it transformed the nature of war. Today we'll be talking about the bloody conflict that occurred after the Clone Wars, but before the more famous Galactic Civil War. Much of the information we'll be talking about today comes from the Essential Guide to Warfare, which does a great job of collecting not only disparate bits of information Information, but also adding new lore to make everything flow smoothly. So if you enjoy this, maybe check it out. Anyway, unsurprisingly, at the end of the Clone Wars, Palpatine did not tell the Republic foundries, or in Star Wars Legends, the cloning factories, to stop the production of war assets. In fact, we know that production at this point was probably still at an all-time high, given the massive levels of production the Republic was achieving by the wartime end's Outer Rim sieges. The end of the Republic, of course, also brought a surging of state power. Many private corporations, including the Trade Federation, Banking Guild, and others, which had supported the CIS during the Clone Wars, were imperialized. Corporations which, at least for now, remained independent, like Kuat Drive Yards, were brought in even closer to the Empire. I say all of this because it serves as an important setup for what comes next. Whereas the Republic was more of a coalition that systems would voluntarily join, the Empire asserted themselves across the entire galaxy. There wasn't a question of whether a certain planet or system would join the Empire, it was more of whether the Empire wished to exert control over that part of space. And the Empire looked to increase their reach. The galaxy was split up into sectors, Moths were assigned, and Palpatine began giving individuals extreme amounts of power. This all leads to a conflict that the Essential Guide to Warfare calls the Reconquest of the Outer Rim. This was a bunch of things coming together. The Empire was really looking to assert their dominance and control across the entire galaxy, but to do so, they had to contend with several factors. One, there were still active separatist holdouts. Two, Republic authority and presence had sharply declined in the Outer Rim, even where they did have jurisdiction. And three, there were lots of crime syndicates which had extreme amounts of power. The reconquest of the Outer Rim was meant to handle all of these factors at once. Something that was probably only possible given the fact that the Empire was, as mentioned, essentially still in a fully mobilized war mode and were still actively making military units. In 19 BBY, the same year the Clone Wars ended, the reconquest of the Rim began, with the Empire still employing traditional Republic assets like the Venator, while also beginning to transition into new ships like the Imperial Star Destroyer, which was introduced at the end of the war. Early fighting saw the Empire's admirals facing off against Separatist forces joined with what we would consider low lowlifes of the Outer Rim, everything from what the Essential Guide to Warfare identifies as Thalassian slavers to shadowy corporate interests. The initial three-theater push saw the Empire fairly successful in both space and on the ground. This is where we also begin to see several prominent Imperials start to earn their place, including the eventual Grand Moff Tarkin, but also renowned tactician Dodonna, who would, of course, defect to the Rebellion, and admirals like Screed. One of the major conflicts of 19 BBY saw the Empire facing off against the remnants of the Trade Federation. Now, technically, the Trade Federation was no longer meant to exist, as it had been directly imperialized. So here, the Empire was technically facing off against bits of the Trade Federation, which legally shouldn't have existed. For those wondering, well, I thought all droids were shut off. 
The Central Guide to Warfare specifically notes that some CIS forces were able to reactivate droids, and that did lead to increased fighting not only in the Outer Rim, but also more coreward, including as far in as the Mid Rim. In 18 BBY, there was a famous campaign where Imperial Admiral Wolf Yularen would lead a fleet of Invincible class heavy cruisers, which were absolutely ancient vessels against Outer Rim scum, including Zygerian slavers. And that year also saw the Empire attempting to basically shore up their supply chains, trade corridors, and vital resources throughout the galaxy. 17 BBY saw Tarkin personally leading a massive campaign to pacify what was known as the Western Reaches portion of the Outer Rim. And with the Empire's success there, they won a major psychological victory as they were seen as having effective control over much of the galaxy, which was in stark comparison to the Republic. This wouldn't, however, be the end for separatism or certainly rebellion in the galaxy. Star Wars Battlefront 2, for example, deals with the 501st, shutting down separatist holdouts even after this point. And, of course, when the Alliance was formed, many separatists would join, which is somewhat ironic given that the Alliance is stated goal was to restore the Republic. Unsurprisingly, the Alliance also got their hands on a lot of old Separatist warships, including a Lucra Hulk, the Fortressa, and perhaps most famously, a heavily modified Providence known as Rebel One. Interestingly, we don't hear a whole lot about how Separatists played into the eventual formation of the Republic, and they were probably fine with that. The New Republic had to essentially start from scratch, despite the fact that they carried the name of the Republic. That's because systems were choosing using to either stay with the Empire, to join the Republic, or to stay neutral. Part of the issue is, when it comes to full-scale war, it's not really clear why the CIS couldn't just leave the Republic, which again, was a voluntary organization. The Republic was not, unlike the Empire, extending its jurisdiction forcefully. But guys, that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, check out the link in the description for Audible. Great service. I absolutely love it. But until next time, be safe, have a good one, and may the Force be with you.